we we talked about had you ever been in the backyard have you ever been in the house all those things and you said you hadn't not while well, they were there no okay well I don't I don't believe you oh. Tony, I don't think you're telling the whole truth okay your DNA is in the backyard the morning that she was discovered missing on the night of May 13, 1997, Shannon Hatfield tucked her eight-year-old daughter Kirsten into bed, never anticipating the tragedy that awaited them. The following morning, Kirsten had vanished, making every parent's worst nightmare come true. As if it wasn't haunting enough for her parents, chilling traces were found in the family's backyard. Her torn underwear stained with blood and distressing blood traces on her bedroom windowsill. For years, her disappearance remained one of the most haunting unsolved mysteries. However, in 2015, the case saw a shocking twist. Anthony Palma, a 56-year-old man living merely two doors away from the Hatfields, emerged as a prime suspect. But he wasn't just any neighbor. For years, rumors were circulated about Palma's creepy behavior, especially towards children. Disturbingly, his blood perfectly matched the samples from Kirsten's window and underwear, leading to his arrest. That particular day brought law enforcement to Tony's door, inviting him into a detailed conversation. Kind of tell me 17 years ago how your life was, how that neighborhood was, what was going on in that neighborhood. I know I've talked, I've read some of the reports that uh, from the interviews before and how it appears to me that you, they call you Uncle Tony around there because you care about the kids. You would feed well, them the kids. Yeah. Basically when I moved nature. there, lived there, there was a bunch of older people. That was like a, I don't know, not a no retirement place, but most of the people in that area were old retirees. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I... Being, I like doing stuff all the time. You know, I was always outside, and if somebody's working on their vehicle, got to go be busybody, hey, you know, and help them. Or somebody's washing machine was broke down. And older people, you know, they can't, not older people, <laughs> you know, can't do stuff. And I've always been mechanically inclined, you know, where I could figure stuff out, you know, right. or help them move this, or, you know, just, I've always been, I don't know about friendly, but neighborly. Right, and that being my first home, right. you know, I tried to make it where that neighborhood was my home. Yeah. Well, did you help any of the kids over there? Well, well when you the feed them pizza. Yeah, I've always there's always that's you my pet, Kool Aid house. Well, I don't know about Kool Aid. That's yeah. always been my pet peeve. Is I grew up hungry, you know, and I don't. There's a lot of kids hungry. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, not where I'd go down my way, hey, you hungry? But I mean, you see kids, you're over there eating something, and they're just, right. you know, you see them draw, right. here, they get, right. I can't stand that. Yeah. And I'm that like that now, I got two damn kids in my house, grown boys. One, they, he says that when he was at his house, they, they didn't, he didn't eat from Monday to Friday until he got to my house. You know, that's, that's one of the stories I, t I want to turn my phone off so people yeah, can me leave too. me alone. Before oh, we get started here, you. Tony, let me go ahead and I want to read you your Miranda warning, okay? okay. Uh, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have him present with you while you're being questioned. Uh, if you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you before any questioning if you wish one. And if you decide to make a statement, you can stop at any time. And do you understand each of those rights? I've explained to you. Having those rights in mind, do you wish to talk to us? Yes. Okay. As my partner uh, Lander said, um, we're still working on the Hatfield case. Okay. And there's some things that uh, we want to go back over with you. Um, we try to be as thorough as we can be on cases like this. And um, I'd like to go back initially over some of what you've already talked to okay. uh, Detective Miller about in the past. I wasn't there. I'm kind of up to speed on some of it, but um, my understanding is, is when Kirsten um, 
disappeared. You were still living there yes. at 1104, correct? Okay. Do you mind just initially kind of take us back to 1997 and go back over that, maybe that evening before and into that morning when all of it all kind of started blowing up and just best you can tell us everything you remember. <coughs> And, t and take your time. I know we're going back some, some years. Yeah, here. I know. Starting to get that old timer stuff. But really, the only thing I can really remember is afterwards, you know, when, you know, because it, it was just a, a typical day. You know, got off work, went home, had supper, watched TV. Because used to <laughs> being a landscaper my yard was my pride. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted to play in my yard because my yard was nothing but Bermuda. There I mean, I, had, <laughs> you know, I just had Bermuda grass. Sure. But I mean, not that they came over there, but that's what I did. I always, I always worked on my yard. Mm -hmm. and, and, and back then, you were, you said you were working at the Capitol? Yes. So, okay. So, you, you were very experienced at keeping the yard. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, uh, well, you know, got chemical license, all the gas and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You remember anything about the the day or evening before? You said it was just a typical day. You worked all day and then went home. You remember anything unusual about that evening that stands out to you? No, other than what I told them about, you know, seeing the white truck, you know, in front of their the white Chevy truck in front of their yard. Okay. You know, no, I, I like I said, I didn't I didn't have anything to do with those people. Didn't know them at all. You know, okay. it's not like I went, hey, yeah, you, you got your little girls? No, it wasn't like that. Okay. I was, usually I was outside working on my yard, you know, either talking to the neighbors or kid would come by, Tony, can you fix my bike? You know, stuff like that. When the officers gently steered the conversation back towards the day Kirsten vanished, Tony described it as just another day. After returning from his job at the Capitol, he busied himself with his beloved yard work. When nudged for more details, he recalled spotting an odd white truck in the vicinity. Tony, having not interacted directly with Kirsten's family, spoke instead of his connection with Trista, a local girl. Eventually, the dialogue swung back to the Hatfields. As their chat veered back to the Hatfields, Tony couldn't quite remember how long they had been part of the community. But he did recall William, a previous neighbor he'd once helped set up a fence. You know, it wasn't like I'd tell them to come over or anything. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go to other people's houses unless, you know, I, I was needed or something like that. But everybody just got, oh, Tony will fix your bike and blah, 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 you know. And I tried to make it feel like, you know, that was kind of a safe place, you know, for, sure. you know. Because I had Tristy at the time. Uh, she wasn't there during that time. But I had Tristy there since she was, you know, small. And whenever she was there, you know, the kids would come and play with her. And, now, you who know, is Tristy? She was my, well, one of my girlfriend's daughters okay. that stayed with me a lot. Okay. So you, you had a good bond with Tristy, I'm assuming? Oh, yeah. yeah. But she and her mom. Yeah. Who, who was mom? Uh, mom's dead, unfortunately. Uh, Melody, uh, I wonder which name she wanted to go to. Howell. How old yeah, is Tristy now? Uh, Grown, I'm assuming. Yeah, about 30. Okay. No, I, I, we don't talk that much anymore because everybody's into this computer stuff and that's how they commu co you know, communicate. But my daughter was looking on her Facebook and she'd send us a text that she was fixing to have a, or that I'm a grandpa. No. She had a daughter. Okay. You said you didn't know um, them, I'm assuming you're meaning Shannon and Kirsten. Yeah. yeah. And I couldn't even tell you how long they they lived there. Okay. I was going to actually ask you that. Um, so you didn't know how long they'd been living there when this happened. And I, I, going to think they hadn't been there very long. And and tell me what you remember about that. Do you remember seeing them move in or anything? No. No. I'm trying to remember. I. There were a friend of mine lived in that house. Uh, I can't remember what his damn name is, but he had a uh, janitorial service, mm -hmm. Janny King. Mm -hmm. 
and I visit with him. I helped him put the fence up around his house. You know, helped him. In fact, his boy come up missing one day. Really? Yeah. He was like seven or eight or younger than that. And we went looking everywhere for him. We finally found him. He was under the bed. <laughs> went to sleep and crawling cold. underneath yeah. the bed. But I mean, everybody was freaking. We had Midwest City out there. And of course, you know, everybody in the neighborhood was out there looking. Me and him were you know going up street you know hollering his name and then sure. she calls and says, yeah we found him he's like there's yeah. a mood. that's usually where we start you learn that early on in uh, fto school check all the closets check check out in the boat in the backyard and the shed yeah. and, uh, so you're saying this friend of yours lived at uh, the house where right. shannon and kirsten lived right okay and was that immediately before them or do you know do you remember I don't remember to tell you the truth. Okay. And I don't remember if after he moved out, if there had been somebody in that house before they did or, or what. I don't remember. You remember that guy's name? Uh, you said you did. William know. was his first name. Okay. I don't remember what his last name was. That's been a while back. And you said you helped put up the fence around the property. So we're we talking about the yeah, stockade the fence, fence in the fence, back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you and William put that up. Yeah plank at a time. That's the old old school way. Yeah. You know, make it look stick, nice that stick way. Stick at the time, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, we had to put it up twice because we had a storm come in and it blew one side all the way back down. So we had to go put it back up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got him to finally put the, the steel, the metal uh, the holes. Yeah. Okay. So, had you ever been inside that house when that gentleman lived there, William? Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you don't recall his name, but he owned or worked for Jamie King? I think he, he had a, what do you call it, you know, uh, anyway, yeah. A janitorial he, service? Yeah, it was a janitorial service, but, you know, you can have a, a piece of that company, but you still be the company that you're your own boss. Franchise. There we go. That's the critter I was looking for. So you never, I, I'm assuming you probably saw Shannon and Kirsten running around the neighborhood and so forth. To tell you the truth, until that happened, I I, I think I seen the kid one time. She was playing with uh, uh, Crystal that lived up the street. But I don't remember if it was in that time frame or what. I don't, I don't really know. Because I, like I said, I didn't pay no attention. Okay. Do you remember ever like giving food to Kirsten oh, or no. talking to Kirsten? No. Was she ever at your house? No. Anything like no. that? Okay. No. And do you remember? I'm kind of. I'm. I'm actually a leery guy until you know people start coming around. You know, I. I just. I'm just. Just. Oh yeah, I will be your friend. You know. No, not like that. Yeah. But I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have. Don't didn't pay attention to you know who all was there or who they were you know and things like that in my world just fall in place you know we accidentally meet oh okay yeah now I know you you know right. then but no never okay. never do you ever recall helping Kirsten with her by no. or anything you don't no. remember any interactions with her no. at all no I know there wasn't any interactions I didn't I didn't know them at all and I like I said I don't even know how long they've been living there until that happened okay because I was always me, that was back when I was fishing. I'd uh, usually come off of work, I'd load up my poles, and go to Draper. And sometimes I'd stay there all night. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd always have, you know, second jobs, you know, after after hour jobs, mm -hmm. either landscaping or anything, anything to make a buck. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that Detective Miller talked to you this before, but am I correct that you said you had never been over there mowing for Shannon or no, working on never. her property or okay. no. seems like that that come up somebody thought you might have been mowing over there or mm -hmm. something no he was asking the, if it's about something about a handyman was what okay. he was asking me about okay well do you remember ever mowing over there no. or anything like that no okay Did, while they lived there do you remember ever being in the yard the front or backyard no. for any reason Okay, how about in the house? Nope. Okay. 
So there was never any time no. that Shannon asked for your help no. to fix this or that or no. mow the yard for me or. Okay. Just tell you the truth, the, the only and I didn't even recognize her when y'all showed me the pictures of her. Mm -hmm. That was the only time I could actually say, okay, that's, you know. I met her once afterwards. She was going up and down the street and, you know, she was still looking for her kid and, you know, I met her once. So I gave her some money so she'd have gas money so she could keep doing what she was doing, you know. Was this like in the day, days after or yeah, we're talking days a after? Let, let, let me bounce back a little bit. We got off a little bit off track. Um, I was kind of having you go back over what you remembered through the night, uh, and I, I read over the, the FBI notes that they took when they talked to you. I guess there was some information about you hearing dogs barking. Yeah, I had a dog in the backyard, dog, his name was Doug. About 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, he went to Raising Hell. So I just, you know, really, believe it or not, in my neighborhood, we still got skunks and possums and stuff like that, plus other dogs, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why that woke me up, but because I usually didn't wake up, and and usually he's out inside anyway, but it woke me up, and he was barking at that back fence, at our back fence. But at the time, as you walk out my back door, I had an old apricot tree. So unless you went went out there, you know you couldn't see. And I just hollered at him because you know thinking it was another dog, or because there was always and traffic. There was human traffic back there, but usually yeah, it was other dogs. Yeah. There was other dogs or cats. There was always animals through there. So I just, you know, I really didn't think nothing about it. I just hollered at him, and he came in, and I went back to bed. While he recognizes names like Shannon, Kirsten, and others, he stated in his account that his interactions with them were limited. He mentioned having seen Kirsten playing once, but he doesn't recall much else. Through the initial exchange, it seems that while he was present during the time of the event, his direct involvement or knowledge remains minimal. Um, I'm curious about your your thoughts on what happened, who might be involved, that kind of thing. I don't know, to tell you the truth. Like I said, I didn't know him. But the one thing that's always bothered me, that she left, the mom. Mm -hmm. She went to Jones, I guess, with her dad or something like that. I, you could have got me off out of my house. I mean, yeah, I know, what if she comes back or, you know, what if somebody makes a call or, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. I, there was no way I'd left that house. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that bothers me. Yeah. So you felt like she shouldn't have left, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever at any point over these years or, or back when it occurred um, have any knowledge of what happened or know no. who was involved? No. Were you in any way involved? No. So you're not responsible no. for Kirsten's disappearance? No. Didn't play any part in that? No. Like I said, didn't know him. Didn't have, like I said, I just barely, you know, see, might have seen her once, twice, mm -hmm. playing with the kids. But other than that, I didn't, I didn't know him. What, just out of curiosity, what do you think the motivation was of whoever did this? I mean, why would this have happened? Well, Dan, I couldn't have told you, but after over the years, you know, and hearing the rumors and this and that and the other, it, me, it always boils down to drugs. You know, I heard that she was on meth and cocaine and all this other, and Don's wife was the same thing. You know, she said, yeah, she had been over there, you know, that night, and they got lit up. So apparently she did get lit up because... You know, if somebody did come in, mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't you heard it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, but I know that some people. That she left Kirsten home alone. You think? Or no, I don't know. I'm sure she did. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Like I said, I didn't know, and I really didn't pay much attention to, to Don and his wife. It's just duh. Uh, uh, where did they live? I'm I'm pretty sure kind of catty corner to me. Straight, straight across the street. Not straight. Just catty corner. A little White House catty corner for me. Okay. And they had two or three kids, and I'd come home one day. I was rewarding myself. I did something, and I was stopped at uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Got me a family pack of chicken. I was going to go down. And the kids, whenever I walked up, they was just the way they were eyeballing me. You know, like 
they had they ain't nothing. I mean, they were really if you'd have, if you'd have seen them, you'd have thought that too. Because I mean, they were skinny. Mm -hmm. So I got me a piece of chicken. I was chewing on it, and they just you want some chicken? <gasps> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that all right? They can have this. Yeah. So I, I just gave them the whole damn thing. Yeah. That's good. Because I'm, I'm no, it's not now. It's something everybody do. When you got kids that are, you know. And I know he, he was a welder by trade, but he, you know, talking to him a time or two, you know, things weren't going right for him, and you know, he didn't have money and all that. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't have a problem, you know. Who are we talking about was a welder, Don? Don? Okay. Um, from looking back over the history, I, I understood that uh, Shannon's brother, I guess, stayed with you for Aaron, a short Aaron. time. Aaron. Aaron. Yeah, Aaron. Tell us about that. How did that happen? And <coughs> he was in the neighborhood, you know, he's looking, apparently looking for, you know, his niece. Mm -hmm. So I'm out there one day and he stops and he talks, you know anything, blah, 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 you know, and we just got to talking and, you know, he's living in a damn, you know, under a bridge and, dude, you know, I found out already that he, that night, that he'd been locked up, mm -hmm. you know, so he wasn't a suspect in my books. So, yeah, I opened my house to, you know, if you ain't got no, because I did that for anybody, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it's sick to say, but that's the kind of guy I am. So, he needed a place to say, there's a couch, you know, you can trash here for a couple of days and, you know, try to do what you got to do to, you know, right. figure out what happened to your knees. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's, like y'all, that's serious. Sure, absolutely. That's a serious how, how long after Kirsten went missing did this happen? Was it like the same week? Was yeah, it probably in the same week. In the same week. Yeah. And then I can't I can't verify that because like I said that's that's been a while. Oh yeah. But sure. yeah, it was probably about in the same week. How long did Aaron stay there with you? Uh, just a couple of days, and then you know he'd go off, and then he'd come back, and then I wound up having to just tell him he couldn't come back because I he was on meth too. Then at the time didn't know it. And I think too because you you you've heard that Shannon was using drugs too. I mean I don't know for for a fact, but that's what I heard. And it, I'll just say this: if you ever partied with them, if you knew they were doing drugs or witnessed it, just just tell us that. I don't know. We're, we're not. No, I don't. I no. Like I said, there's and y'all know you got people that do drugs, you got people that drink, and you don't do drink, and you don't you know do I drink. Yeah. But no, I never party with him. And yeah. I never party with Don and his wife. Okay. Now, did you know Aaron at all before? No. So you never met him, never talked to him no. before either? No. Did he ever confide in you anything about uh, the case or anything about Just Shannon? He couldn't, he couldn't clear his sister. Those words will always, you know, I can't, there's the way he said it. Mm -hmm. I can't clear my sister. So he was suspicious of, of Shannon, huh? Did he ever give you any any real factual information that would be beneficial to the case? No, I'm, I, like I said, I'm here on my own free will. If I had any information, yeah, I'd give it to you. Because that'd be the same thing if something were to happen to my daughter. My God, yeah. The chat drifts for a while, but then eventually circles back to the heart of the matter, Kirsten. Tony is questioned about his knowledge of her disappearance, and his unease about the little girl's disappearance becomes very noticeable. Speculations emerge regarding drugs, particularly meth and cocaine, being the potential motivation for her sudden disappearance. Tony, showcasing a softer side, recalls some underprivileged kids he once met, hinting at a deeper empathy within him. The story takes a turn as he dives into an account of Shannon's brother, Aaron. Aaron bunked with Tony while in town searching for Kirsten. Intriguingly, Aaron was suspicious of his own sister, Shannon, but he never provided concrete details, at least as per Tony. Despite initially offering Aaron a place to stay, Tony eventually had to kick him out due to Aaron's drug issues. I don't know how she does it. I mean, if she's innocent, God bless her soul. I don't know how she does it because I just thinking about it. What would I do if my daughter come up missing? Hell yeah. And she's my world. That's all I've got. My old lady can go to hell, but my kid, that's no. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. That's a weird jail because I'll be carrying Midwest City. It's hard to imagine. Um, we've talked a lot about kind of the background. I, I want to kind of talk to you about um, some new information that's developed in this case, okay? Um, as you know, Detective Miller got some buckle swabs from you yeah. uh, a couple months back or whenever it was. There was a reason for that, okay? Um, and we collected DNA samples from lots of people. But we had submitted, resubmitted some evidence from the case and uh, got a DNA hit, okay? okay. Um, the reason those buckle swabs were being collected was we were trying to find the person yeah. responsible. Okay. We, we talked about had you ever been in the backyard, had you ever been in the house, all those things. And you said you hadn't. No, while well, they were there, no. Okay. Well, I don't. I don't believe you, oh. Tony. I don't think you're telling the whole truth. Okay. Your DNA is in the backyard the morning that she was discovered missing. Okay. And on her window, and on the panties she'd been wearing the night before that were recovered in the backyard. No. No, not me, because I was not, no. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's the truth. I find it far-fetched, but no. Because I, I don't know, I didn't know him. And maybe you didn't know him, Tony. But we need and to I didn't have no business over there at all. That may be also. What we need to talk about is what you were doing in that backyard that night. And what happened? We need to get to the truth of. I what have no about. idea what you're talking about. Were you there trying to help Kirsten? No. Like I said, I didn't know anything about them people at all. Nothing. Nothing. Well, never met them. Never said hi, bye, nothing. Well, here's the here's our problem with that. Is how did your DNA get there? Then? Don't know. I mean, is, it a, is this something that's gone on, Tony, that uh, is this one of those things from 17 years ago that a split-second decision has haunted you for 17 years? Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Were you there to help her? No. Like I said, I, don't, I have nothing to do with them people. Nothing. I didn't know them at all. Okay, so how did your DNA I have no idea. Done? there. I have no idea. The investigators emphasize the undeniable nature of the DNA evidence and encourage him to come clean. Tony, however, remains firm in his denials, insisting he doesn't know how his blood could have ended up at the crime scene and seeking an alternative explanation. The room grows tense as the interrogators tap into his sense of morality, suggesting that a confession might just lift the heavy burden he's been carrying for 17 years. The detective continues to confront Tony with the evidence, the DNA found on Kirsten's windowsill and her underwear. And that's, that's what I want to give you an opportunity to do is explain it because it's scientific evidence. We know for a fact it's your blood. And of course, Tony, I don't have to tell you that when these paintings are identified as, as uh, Kirsten's, um, and mom says, yeah, she was wearing those the night before, and the next morning, at dawn, your blood is found in them at the back fence of the property. I mean, if you're in my position as the detective, what does that tell you? Uh, don't look good for me. Uh, <coughs> but, and I, you know, I just want to plead with you to be honest. I want to be honest. I want and you to be honest. And I'm doing honest. Yeah. I don't. You know, I mean, Tony, I think this has gone on for so many years. And has been unsolved, uh, as you well know, for, for a long, long time. Um, and I'm sure you've told people countless times, I had nothing to do with it, I don't know anything about it, et cetera, et cetera. But this isn't the time to keep saying the same old routine, because this isn't going away. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, this is scientific, scientific evidence, Tony. That's your DNA, that's your cells from your body. 
tell us, I mean, tell me what happened. How did you get injured? I'm trying to figure it out myself. You were in, in some way injured for your blood to be on her window and for your blood to be in her panties. Mike, what I want to know from you, was there some kind of a dispute between you and Kirsten? I had no dealings with those people. Didn't know nothing about them. I believe at that. All. I believe that. But I also believe that this is your DNA on her window seal and your DNA on her panties in the backyard. I don't doubt that you didn't know them, but that didn't take this away. This isn't going anywhere. And we've got to get to the truth of the matter. I mean, for you to sit here and say, I've never been in that backyard and I wasn't there, it's a lie, Tony. Yeah, that's not the truth. Saying, yeah. it, it's not the truth. And I gotta believe, if I can speak frankly, you seem like a good guy. And I, I know if I'd made a mistake like that, and we all make mistakes, we're all sinners. But I gotta believe this has been bugging you for your entire life since it happened. Right. If if it doesn't, then you're a cold blooded killer, Tony. Is that what you're telling me? I ain't never killed nobody. Okay. So you're telling me what happened that morning or that night hadn't been bothering you all these years? That's not me. I don't. Was I, that was that the alcohol or were you experimenting with no, something else? I don't do night? drugs, and I don't know. I don't know. I I still trying to fathom in my mind what blood, my blood. Yeah. I was nowhere around there. Didn't know them people. Didn't have no dealings with them people. Didn't care about them people. Tony, this this is your I understand. Okay, I'm, I, you can sit here and say that same crap over and over. You and I both know that's not the truth. No, it's the truth will have to come out. I don't understand this. The truth is what needs to come out. Yeah, and you're the only person that can do that. You're the only person that can bring. Kirsten back and let her family have a proper burial for her. You're the person that can help me that. You made a mistake, Tony. Okay, you made a huge mistake. Do what's right now. Take responsibility for what happened and help us get Kirsten back. I can't help you. Don't know. I don't understand. You said that's not me, and when and when somebody says that to me, what it says is that's not, I, I, I wasn't in my right mind. I was no. under the influence. <laughs> well, in the influence, like I said, if I had a beer, I might have had two. I went to bed. I always go to bed. I'm a ten o'clock bedtime guy. The only reasons here lately I haven't been going to sleep is because I have to have a treatment, and I wake up every two and a half hours, three hours, take treatment go back to sleep. I have nothing bothering me other than breathing problems. So your conscience hasn't been bothering you for all these years? No. Let me ask you this. Your wife told us that every year on Kirsten's anniversary that you're upset about it, that you go through a phase of being depressed and upset about it. <sighs> And the reason that is, it's on the news, and yeah, how do you feel about it? Well, yeah, I'm going to be upset. I mean, it's a missing child. Duh. Mm -hmm. But I mean, as far as me, oh, what, what day is this? No. It's not just a missing child, Tony. It's a missing child with your blood on her windowsill and your blood on her panties. So should that affect you? Absolutely. Yeah. And that tells me you're human. That tells me that you have a heart and you have a conscience. But you're not showing it sitting here and denying that you've never been in there. I don't know anything about it. That wasn't me. That's not the truth, Tony. This is the time to I get your chest. I understand that. Yes, but I, I don't get it. Now, you need to think about that. Because I'm just telling you, when all this gets presented to the judge and jury. I understand. Do you think anybody's going to believe what you're saying? Good, don't me. No. Yeah. I Nobody's going to believe you. I just, because it's not the truth, Tony. The emotional appeal is paired with the detective's frustration at Tony's repeated denials. 
The detective further uses emotional appeals, stating how Tony's wife has told them that he gets depressed at every anniversary of Kirsten's disappearance, claiming that it means he's human and that this is his moment to confess. Tony, however, remains insistent that he does not know anything. So her DNA's on it, your DNA's on it, and it's also on the windowsill. That was all done way back when this all happened. It's just now that the DNA um, results have come back. And I don't know if they told you this, you seem like an intelligent man, so to help you comprehend what we're talking about when we say we know this to be a fact, the number sextillion, what this is saying, if you take a one and you put 21 zeros behind it, yeah, it's, it's, it's yours. <coughs> um, any, anybody in the world, any scientist is going to say that that is your blood. Now, obviously when we have a case like this, we're not going to Mr. Palmer, we're not going to lay out everything that we know and everything we have. Um, that's just not the way it works. It'd be counterproductive. Um, we're not going to do it. There's more than this, but we want to try to get you to digest, kind of digest one thing at a time. Now, having said that, um, do we know all the circumstances surrounding what happened that night? We don't. Um, only, only God, the person who did it, and Kirsten probably know that. But I'm going to tell you this. We do know that Kirsten was wearing those that night. We do know that your blood's on there and her DNA's on there. And that is just an absolute fact. Right. Yeah, I understand that. Um, and I, I tell you, you know, just listening and talking to you, um, you know, 17, 18 years now has passed. Um, I'm going on my 25th year here. Um, I worked every case you could probably imagine. Um, so is Detective Miller, like he was telling you. Um, we're not brilliant men by any stretch of the imagination, but when it comes to this stuff, um, we're, we're pretty darn smart. And this is what it boils down to. Um, this much time can pass and if something horrible happens in your life that you don't want to remember you can put it in a little box and put it out here and try to keep it away from you um, it, it happens um, I've had to put horrible things that have happened in my life and put it in a little box out here and just hope that it goes away and that pray that one day it doesn't come out because I've seen some some terrible things. The detectives continue to point out that in the current age, the evidence collection would be even more extensive. They keep pressing for answers about Tony's interactions with the FBI, including discussions about polygraph tests. The investigators bring up DNA evidence reports linking Tony to the scene. They repeatedly try emotional appeals, saying they don't believe that Tony is an evil man, that he was a hard-working man who had a momentary lapse that led to this. But Tony continues to deny involvement, despite evidence as stark as this. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. This guy especially has been pushing to allow uh, him to be able to talk to you and, and try to make some sense about it and give you an opportunity to tell the truth. I was, heck, I was kind of against it, to be honest with you. Um, because that you don't get that kind of scientific evidence every day. That is absolutely the most okay. astronomical thing that you could imagine. It's about like every grain of sand on the, the whole planet Earth um, or the odds that it's not you that were the last person that touched her panties. That was the last person that went through that window. The, the odds are they're uh, uncomprehendable. So is that is that the way it's going to be, Tony? Is it going to be is it going to be a deal where, to till the day you die, you're going to um, uh, proclaim my innocence? Yeah.
I mean, well, extra, that, extra, that extra, all right I, there. well, I can tell you, I can tell you this. Well, that's fair enough. I'm not going to argue with you or get into a battle with you. Um, I can tell you this. Um, everything that we were going to do here today and everything that you were going to tell us is going to go into a report. Um, it could either be a report saying that um, he manned up and had some remorse, or it can be that it's that evil person that we were afraid of. And that's up to you. That is told that ball is totally in your court. The emotional weight of the situation is seen throughout the interrogation as the investigators reveal that they've been searching for the missing person for 17 years. Tony is also told of a search that is being conducted on Tony's property. Despite being met with hints and veiled threats about the evidence and implications, Tony remains steadfast in his claims of innocence. I ask you again, where's she at? I can't help you. Okay, I want you to understand too, and you probably already know this, you're not leaving this room down. I understand not. Okay. And you understand that it's probably going to be quite a while that you're going to spend in jail. Just because we don't have a body doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to charge you with anything. I I've got that. enough evidence against you. But, nope. go ahead. Sorry. Tony, there's, there's an arrest warrant in that deal signed by a judge, and it's for murder. And judges don't sign that unless there's probable cause. And to be fair to you, okay, to be fair to you, um, you're not going anywhere. You're you're being charged with murder. And here's the deal I want you to remember. Um, right now, we're interviewing every one of your family members. You can probably hear it in the next room. We're already at your house. We will have back hose, ground penetrating sonar, cadaver dogs, the whole nine yards. Oh. We was laughing about that yesterday. What's so funny about that? that if y'all were to ever go in our backyard, I got dogs and cats and pets everywhere in that backyard. <coughs> I don't know what the hell we was laughing about that. We was watching something on TV. Like where you bury them? Or animals, yeah. Well, well, so we're well. not going to find, and, and this is your opportunity because, I mean. You ain't going to find first and a half field in my backyard. Or on your property anywhere. No. Where do I find her? I don't know. Did you black out and you took her somewhere and dumped her? I didn't get her. Who did? Well, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna we're gonna leave it with um, you're that person that has no remorse, and that's the way the report's gonna read. Yeah. Because what I'm seeing from you is you could care less if we ever find her. And yeah, I did. You okay. could care less. Just put a cigarette out for me. Turn around for me. Put your hand behind your back. Relax. You're under arrest for murder, kidnap, Kirsten Hatfield. After 15 years of uncertainty surrounding Kirsten's mysterious disappearance, DNA evidence found at the scene points directly to her neighbor, Tony. Despite the compelling evidence against him, Tony constantly denies any involvement in her vanishing. His denials, however, cannot overshadow the irrefutable forensic proof, leading to his subsequent arrest as he is being charged for murder.